Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next session of the Spring 2021 Introduction to Data Science Workshop Series. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the Cal's Visualization Core Laboratory and a certified instructor with software and data carpentry. So this afternoon, we're going to continue this series of workshops um, to build foundational skills in uh, computational science, data science, and machine learning with a discussion of version control using Git and GitHub. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So let me share my screen. Okay. So uh, this afternoon, we're going to be covering, as I said, version control with Git. Um, this is a slightly more technical um, topic than our previous, uh, our previous topics where we covered Bash and Conda and Python. Um, but the goal is to give you enough of an understanding of version control with Git to understand kind of why you should be using version control, um, how to do version control with Git, and then um, how to set up um, an account on GitHub and interact between local repositories uh, on your laptop, your workstation, and remote repositories on, say, GitHub. Um, so once you've gone through this material, you should be um, well equipped to start um, kind of if you wanted to build a portfolio of projects on GitHub, um, you should have all the skills that you would need in order to do that, um, as well as an understanding about how you might go about collaborating with others, um, whether that is your research colleagues or peers, or whether you would like to start contributing to some of the open source software packages that we, um, that we saw last week when we did our introduction to Python, you should have some idea of how, how you would need to get started if you wanted to be an open source contributor as well. So the things that we're going to cover um, is probably some subset of this. So we'll talk about um, automated version control, which basically is the motivation of, of version control in general and Git in particular. We'll talk about setting up Git, creating repositories, tracking changes, exploring history. So these are kind of the core uh, lessons here that you need to um, uh, understand to kind of work locally uh, with Git for yourself on just projects where you're using version control as a way to record and keep track of your own work. Then um, ignoring things and remotes in GitHub will um, kind of allow you to start working with GitHub and sharing your work with, uh, with the wider world and community. Um, and then after that, af probably after our mid-afternoon break, we'll talk about um, how to collaborate via Git. Um, and we'll talk a little bit of the type of conflicts that can arise when you um, start collaborating with other people on a shared, uh, shared project or code base. And then depending on how much time we have at the end of the day, I may talk about um, briefly some subset of, of topics related to open science, code licensing, um, citation, hosting services. Um, and we will not cover this um, using Git from RStudio. That's not relevant for this more Python focused course. But along the way, I will be showing you how to um, perform some of the, the uh, version control functions um, within Git inside of JupyterLab using a JupyterLab plugin for Git and GitHub. OK. All right. So let me just make sure I haven't talked so long that my Jupyter Lab session has uh, timed out on me. It appears like it has not. So that's great. So today we're going to be working almost entirely within the terminal, um, with with a few a few exceptions. So we'll need to open a terminal window. Okay, and we can just run the. I'll make this a little bit uh, bigger, and we can just run the. Uh, PWD, the print working directory command, and see that we should be in the home directory for our fictional user, Jovian. Okay, cool. Um, 
And so this, this course is going to assume some level of familiarity with um, bash commands like PWD. So um, not even all of the bash commands that we covered in the introduction to shell a few weeks ago, but like some subset of those, but I, I'll try to remind you what these bash commands do as I go, um, as I use them, but you will be kind of relying on some of that bash knowledge from a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, quick note in passing. So there are setup instructions uh, here. If you want to install Git um, locally, there's a link here um, which explains how to install and set up Git. Um, with Linux and Mac, it's it's fairly uh, fairly straightforward. With Windows, you have to uh, unless you have a very new version of Windows, you'll have to install a few other things. Um, but there are instructions if you're interested in in installing it locally. Okay, so let's just get started with automated version control. Okay, so this is the quick kind of uh, thirty thousand foot pitch for why you should use uh, version control. So. This is a, uh, a comic that um, speaks to most every PhD student. Um, I certainly had this experience when I was going through my PhD and my master's degree when I was working with my advisors um, who probably to this day um, continue to email documents back and forth where they just Every time they make revisions, they'll just you know change the file, um, change the file name, and so this email document just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it gets harder and harder to keep track of what changes have been made by who and when, and it becomes a bit of an annoying mess. So we want to move away from this workflow, and we want to move towards a. Uh, a more rigorous method of keeping track of changes um, of who has done what and why um, when you're collaborating, not only with your research colleagues and peers, but ideally also with your, uh, your PIs or um, supervisors, et cetera. Okay. So the what, uh, what version control, so that's kind of the problem that we want to solve with, um, with version control. Um, but the way version control systems work, all of them, um, is that you have kind of this base document and then you record a, the sequence of changes that are made to that, um, to that document. So the version control system that you might be most familiar with would be something like Microsoft Word's tracking changes or Google Docs uh, version history or things like this. So, but the concept is, is the same. You have a, a base document and then you have a set of changes. And when you apply that set of changes to the base document, you get a new document. And if you keep track of basically the sequence of change sets, then you can build up the current document from applying these change sets to get uh, until you get to the current version of the document. And similarly, you can think about rewinding history. So this is history going forward, but history going back is basically just undoing a change set. And so if you undo this last three lines of this document, you revert to this previous version here. And if you undo that set of changes, you go back to the original um, base document. Okay. So once you have this, this the key idea is that you need to keep the changes that are made stored separately from the document itself. And once you do that, then you can think about creating different documents by replaying um, different sets of changes in different orders. And so that's kind of what this picture is illustrating here. So starting from a, um, a base document, one user uh, or one collaborator could make this set of changes to result in this document. Another collaborator could make a different set of changes that result in this document. And so now we have two new documents with different changes and these changes might conflict with one another or they might not. Um, and in fact, in, in this case, this is supposed to illustrate basically these, this change it was in the first paragraph, this change adds 
two new lines to the second paragraph. So actually these changes do not impact or conflict with other in any way. So you can actually cleanly just combine them to, to arrive at a, uh, a commonly shared document that incorporates both of those changes. So um, as you might imagine, this process can, can sometimes get a bit messy as you increase the number of collaborators or you increase the number of, of files that you're, of documents that you're keeping track of. But that's where a version control tool comes into play, like Git. So uh, version control systems are, um, each version control system is going to keep a record of these change sets and they're gonna refer to that record as a commit. And it's a commit that incorporates the changes plus some useful metadata that describes what the changes are, what they do, who made them um, and things like that. And then a repository is basically a collection of, of base documents, as well as a sequence of commits that captures the change sets. And then once you have those things, you can move back and forward um, through the, the history of changes made um, to uh, arrive at any particular set of documents in your whole history of your project. Okay, so I guess the, the sum, the way to summarize this is that you can think of version control as being like an unlimited undo button. So if you're used to hitting kind of control and Z to undo uh, the most recent change or maybe the most recent changes, um, you can think of version control systems that as a tool that would allow you to do, to undo or redo as many sets of changes as you want going all the way back to the very beginning of your project. Um, and another good thing about version control, which we'll see um, the, the second half of this afternoon, is that it allows many people to work on a same project in parallel uh, in a way that doesn't block. Um, so in parallel just means that everybody can make changes to their versions of the documents. And then there's a coherent strategy for merging those changes, sometimes in an entirely automated way, um, to arrive at a new um, set of documents for the project. So it, it really enables uh, large scale collaboration and has been a major driver of the explosion of open source uh, software and, um, and research that has happened over the last uh, five to 10 years. Okay, any questions about kind of the motivating pitch for this afternoon before we move on to the next episode? No, okay. Wait, maybe one question. Let's see. Let's see in the chat. Is it like Google uh, Google Lab? So, what do you mean by Google Lab? Do you mean Google Colab or Google Docs? Because um, version control is more is similar to the kind of of um, uh, oh, Google Colab. Okay, so no, Google Colab is um, is similar to Binder. So this is the um, or uh, Binder Hub rather. So um, so what we're using here are free cloud computing resources that are been provided by either uh, the Research Computing uh, IT here at Cal. If you're on the Cal campus and joining us from Cal, or from the Binder Hub team. Um, or the Binder Hub Federation rather, uh, which is a consortium of uh, cloud computing providers and research institutes around the world uh, who are providing free cloud computing resources um, for, um, for researchers um, and anyone to, to use to kind of share their, um, mostly to share their scientific research um, and just kind of interesting work that they're doing. Um, Google Colab is, um, you know, if you go to uh, Google Colab, so Google Colab is a um, a Google sponsored tool that provides a similar thing um, and allows you to run uh, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter notebooks and um, uh, Python code in the cloud on Google's cloud infrastructure. Also allows you to get access to free GPUs. 
um, and free TPUs, um, depending on what you're doing. So um, it is, an, uh, in that sense, it's kind of like an alternative. You should definitely be aware of Google Colab. Um, it's, if you don't have, um, you know, if you're here at Calus, of course, we have some nice GPU computing facilities in the IBEX cluster um, where we can access, uh, you can access GPUs to use for your own work. Um, if you're not in Calst and you don't have access to, to um, GPUs at either um, your, your work or your home or your university, um, then you can use Google Colab to get access to, uh, to free GPUs for doing accelerated data science and machine learning. So that's kind of an aside to the topic that we're going to cover today. Um, but it's worth mentioning um, just in case there's any, any confusion. Okay. Yeah, so version control and Git is a tool that's um, completely separate and, um, and different from Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab or Google Colab. There are uh, plugins and integrations that will allow us to use version control tool or use Git from within Jupyter Lab, and I'll talk about those later this afternoon. But the two things are separate. Okay, so I'm just going to close that. Okay, good questions. So moving on. So setting up Git. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is set up Git. Now. Uh, typically, this is something that you would only do once on your uh, on your local machine, and you would be be done with it. Um, here, if we'll do it once uh, in our cloud instance, but if your Jupyter Lab times out and you need to start it again, you would probably have to go back and rerun these configuration commands again because you have gotten a brand new cloud uh, um, instance that will need to be configured again. So, but typically, you would only do this once. Okay, so we're going to learn how to configure Git and understand the difference between global configuration and local configuration. Okay, so when we're using Git on the computer for the first time, we need to do some configuration. And we are going to um, start running some Git commands to, to do that. So Git commands typically have the structure of the program name, Git, some command, which is typically, although not always a verb of some kind, and then some options. So this is not dissimilar to the kinds of things that we were doing in the bash um, in the bash course. Um, so for example, the first command that we're going to run is going to set the username and the user email. So these are going to pieces of metadata which are going to be assigned to every change that is made by this user in a Git repository. So it's kind of what is tagging the work that you're doing as being done by you and how to contact you. Okay. Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. So we will do um, git config and then dash dash global. So we are going to edit the global config. So this is a configuration for any and all git repositories that are going to be on our computer. And typically you're going to have a different git repository for every project that you work on. And so we're going to set the username uh, to be, um, in this case, we're going to use uh, Vlad Dracula. And so once we have, we type that command and then we hit enter. And you don't get any, um, you don't see any, any, any output. Uh, but a configuration file has been edited when you run that command. And I'll show you those edits in a moment. So if you do git config global followed by user email, then uh, we'll make up an email address for Vlad at Transl and don't forget your close quote. Okay. Okay. 
So um, you can use your, uh, your own name and your own email um, uh, if you want. Um, so this is important if you want to go through the, um, if you want to go through the, um, the GitHub portion of the training in the second half of this afternoon, you will need to um, link your, um, your Git repo with the username and email associated with that uh, GitHub account that we'll create uh, later. So if you've not already, if you don't already have an account on GitHub, I would ask, I'll ask you during the uh, afternoon break and to create that, uh, create that account. So um, if you typed, you know, Vlad Dracula and Vlad at Transylvania, you can just go back and rerun these commands with your preferred um, um, username and an email, and it will just overwrite those settings again. So I'm going to use uh, Ibex training and Ibex training at kaust.edu.sa is, yeah, okay, okay. Um, and if anybody, I see a couple people in the chat who are having trouble getting access to the, uh, the user interface, so I will put that link um, again in the chat. So there's the link that will take you directly to the public Jupyter lab. And, you know, again, if you miss, if you typed this, that's okay. You can, um, you can just retype the, the commands again to set up your username and an email. And um, hopefully your uh, binder hub will just take maybe a little bit to load, but it should eventually load with, with JupyterLab. Um, okay. So if you want to keep your email private, you can use this kind of special email address here. Um, and just use your GitHub username. Um, and that would basically keep, so if I wanted to do that, I could do, um, I could go over here and copy this username and delete this, uh, delete this email, and then just paste in this um, placeholder email that, oh, that, um, that GitHub allows you to use um, in order to avoid having to share your email if you, if you prefer. Okay, so the next bit of configuration is line endings. So um, this is again, kind of a really technical thing, but depending on what, if you're using Mac or Mac and Linux have a, have a particular way of representing um, an end of line, when, like, which is what happens when you press enter on your keyboard you know, you don't see it necessarily when you're, when you're typing a text document, but in the, the metadata about the text file that you're creating, there is a little character that represents the end of line. So whenever you hit enter, there's a little character is kind of put into the file, even though you don't see this character when you, when you're typing and windows uses a different, uh, different character for that. So what happens is that if you're on windows and you open a file that's been written on Mac and Linux, then windows will automatically convert your line endings from Mac and Linux to what windows expects you to use for line endings. And then if you then upload that um, to Git, then you upload that as well as your line endings. And then if someone on Mac or Linux pulls that file down, the line endings will get changed again and so on and so forth. So the way that you avoid this is by actually configuring Git to use a consistent set of line endings so that Git will do this for you. And then no matter whether you're Windows or Mac or Linux, Git will handle making sure that the line endings are set in a consistent fashion. So we're all using Linux today. Um, so 
what we need to do is we can just copy this command here, which is going to configure the line endings uh, properly for uh, the Linux operating system that we're on. So we can just hit enter and there we go. If you're on Windows, you have a slightly different uh, um, um, setting that you would need to put in. Okay. And finally, there is one, uh, one last thing that we need to do, which is to set a default uh, text editor. So there are many different text editors that you can use when you're working with Git. So whenever you make a, um, a commit, write a commit message, you have to use a text editor for that. Um, and we are going to use Nano just because it's already installed inside of our Jupyter Lab uh, instance. So I'm just going to copy Nano and paste that and hit enter. So all done there. Um, but if you were configuring Git on your local workstation and you had some other um, um, preferred text editor that you would like to use besides, uh, besides Nano, then you could configure it um, accordingly. I typically use uh, Visual Studio Code. And so this would be the one that I would use on my local state workstation. Okay. Uh, this is just a little box about how to exit Vim. So if you get stuck in um, Vim is the default text editor and Git, and it was um, it used to be a very popular text editor. I think people are moving away from it um, um, more recently. Um, it has a steep learning curve, but it is very powerful. But if you get stuck in Vim, then these are the controls that you or these are the commands that you need to run to to get out of it. Um, um, if I get stuck in Vim, I'll be sure to to point that out um, and uh, point, I'll go through the commands to show you how to get out. Um, okay. So we've run all these commands to configure Git. So we're, we're done configuring Git. So now if we do Git config and list, we can actually see the configuration that we've set. Um, so in particular, so this is, these are all the settings. And the ones that we have set are um, uh, this one here, and then this one here. But it looks like that username didn't, uh, or sorry, the user email did not execute properly. So I'm going to run that again and look again. So there we go. So now you can see that after I ran this command, which basically stripped out my uh, training email and used GitHub's placeholder email, the user email has been updated. So that's basically what these commands were doing, or uh, updating this configuration file. OK, so there is um, help commands that you can get um, with Git. So if you do um, Git and then config and then dash dash help, um, nope, that didn't seem to work. Oh, is this? Hmm. Okay, so with git help, we can get the, the help menu for the, the different git commands and then um, with the subcommands maybe the syntax has changed slightly let's see okay so I'm just kind of following the uh, the instructions here um, so let's try uh, get help and then um, uh, config. Hmm. Seems to be having trouble pulling up the help menus from inside the instance. I'll have to look at that. Uh, look at that later. I'm not sure why the help menus aren't uh, aren't operating right now. Um, yes, I will make the. So there's a question to make the font a bit larger. So I will. I will do that. 
now I'm just going to clear this out so we get back our, our font. So I'll make that uh, a bit larger. And um, yeah, so those commands will definitely work locally. Um, but for some reason that I can't, can't troubleshoot on the fly, the manual pages um, are, not, uh, are not installed inside this cloud instance. So you just have to use your, the online, you have to use Google <laughs> if you get stuck um, and you won't be able to use the command line help, uh, help menus. Okay, so that was configuring Git. So now we're gonna talk about creating a repository. And so the repository that we're gonna create is we're gonna kind of make up this project where we have these three old movie characters, uh, Wolfman, Dracula, and the mummy who are collaborating on a project to build a uh, some kind of a space colony on Mars. Uh, and that's the idea. And possibly the moon, maybe Pluto. So it's a completely made up, uh, obviously, storyline um, to help kind of motivate the discussion today. So um, the first thing we're going to do, so we'll do print the working directory. And so we're in our home directory. And if we run the list command, we can see that there is a introduction to Git subdirectory that I have uh, included. So we're going to want to change into that. Introduction to Git. OK. And there's nothing in this subdirectory. It's, it's entirely empty. Um, but that's where we're going to be doing our work, uh, our work for the day. OK. Um, so inside this directory, we're going to make our planets directory. So this is kind of like your project. So we're going to make a directory. And inside that directory, we're going to create a Git repository. And then we're going to be version controlling all the files within our project directory. So, um, so planets is going to be the name of our project directory. And we'll change directories into planets. And we can see that there's nothing in the plants directory yet, it's a completely empty directory. And um, even if we run ls-a to look for hidden files or things, we'll see that there's only these references to, um, if you remember from our bash course, so this is a reference to the current directory, and this is a reference to the parent directory. So now we're going to run the command git init, which is going to create an empty git repository inside of this directory. Um, and we are um, just given a warning um, with some another configuration option that we can set, um, which will move away from using master as the as the default branch name and change it to something else. Um, I think we'll just keep it the way it is for now, um, but. This is another configuration option that, that you could set. Um, I think I'm moving toward GitHub is moving towards main as being the uh, as being the default branch. Um, well, why not? I've not done this before, but let's let's change the default branch. So we'll follow the hint. And so now, if we well, if we do ls a, we can see that there is a um, now there's this directory dot git. So this is actually the directory that was created by the git init command. And this is where our repository is going to live. So what we want to do is we'll get a little bit ahead of ourselves and we will just remove that whole directory. So we need to recursively remove the got the dot git directory. And now when we run ls-a, we can see that there's nothing, there's nothing there. It's gone. And now we can. Um, now I'm going to run this um, this other git config command that they're suggesting that I run. Um, running out of terminal space here. And I'm going to set it to main as the default branch. Okay. And now if I was to look at my config again. Um, in somewhere in here, yeah, 
here. The default branch is set to main. And I only, because I, um, because I set the, um, the global config, so this will apply to all of my new projects from now on. So that's what I want. So now I can run, so I'm going to clear, clear this again. And now I'm going to reinitialize the repository. So I'm going to run git init. And we have initialized an empty repository in um, introduction to git slash planets dot git. And we don't have that warning or that hint anymore. Okay, so I'm going to make this a little bit a little bit smaller. Okay, um, so a command that you're going to be typing a lot is git status. So this is the command that kind of tells you what is going on inside your git repository. So I run this command uh, hundreds of times a day, probably when I'm doing my development work. Um, I always am checking to see what my status is on my, on my Git repo. So we're told that we're on branch main. We've not made any commits yet and that there are, there's nothing in our directory that it needs to be tracked. So we're, which is not surprising, right? Because we're in this empty, empty directory. Okay. Um, so there are a, a couple exercises here. And I will set a timer for uh, a few minutes. So if you could just take a look at places to create Git repositories um, and um, have a think about that. And then we'll talk about the solution to this. And then we actually covered this second exercise already um, about how to remove um, Git repositories. Um, so um, you can have a look at this, uh, uh, this solution which is recursively removing the, the .git repository. Okay, so I'll set a little timer. And so please work on this exercise here on places to create Git repo repositories. It's gonna have you think about creating Git repositories and where you would want to create them, whether you need to create a single Git repository in your project directory or whether every directory within your project should have its own Git repository have a think about what you think the answer to that is. And if you have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask them or you can uh, put them in chat and I will just keep an eye on the chat, uh, the chat window. So the name of the repository we created was um, the planets. So that was the directory we created was planets. And then the initial um, branch that I created um, was main. So if I go share my screen again, so there is no difference if, if you, um, so there is no difference between main and master. So the, um, for, I don't know, the last 10 or 15 years or what, since GitHub has been around and since um, Git has been around um, for a lot longer than 10 or 15 years, um, Git was created by uh, Linus Torvalds like 30 years ago um, or something like that. Um, but in, there's no, no difference between main and master. The, the reason that Git gave us a hint that we want, might want to rename our default branch to main is that um, the community is trying to move away from, from language, from using terms like master and master and, and master slave and these kind of, of very um, uh, racially stereotyped uh, language that is sometimes used in computer science. So as a part of an effort to move away from that kind of language, 
Git and GitHub are trying to encourage people to not use master as the default uh, name for their uh, branch, but rather to use main. And, um, and so that's kind of the motivation behind that hint, um, but it's not uh, critical in terms of being able to, to follow along today. So you don't need to, to go back and do that. So I have one, uh, one, so Muna is saying that she's having trouble hearing me. So is anyone else having trouble hearing me? Okay. Okay, so sorry, Muna, it might just be your, your connection. You might want to uh, maybe drop off the Zoom call and then reconnect and see if that will help your, um, uh, help the audio. Um, so Mohammed is asking, so wherever we run git init command, the directory name will become the repo name. Um, so yes, you can think of it like that. So whenever you run the git init command, you're creating a repository inside of a directory. And so the way that I use git, every project uh, has its own directory. And then within that directory, I'll create a git repository. And so um, I don't necessarily think of the git repository as having a name, but I definitely think of it as being associated with a particular directory. Um, so there's a good question. So how can we convert an existing folder into a GitHub repo? So the, if you have an existing project folder that you would like to turn into a Git repository, then all you need to do is run the git init command inside of that folder or that directory. And then that will create a Git repository inside of that folder. And then of course, you'll need to use the Git commands that we're about to learn to add all the things that you're, you're tracking, uh, all the files that you want to track, uh, track to that repository. Now, if you want to then connect that to GitHub, there's a process for doing that, but we're going to cover that later this afternoon um, after, the, the, uh, after the, the break. Another good question. So would you recommend using GitHub desktop over using terminal commands? So I don't know, to be honest, because I've not, when I started learning Git, um, when I was doing my, uh, my master's and PhD um, in the UK about, uh, about five to 10 years ago, um, there weren't a lot of tools like GitHub, uh, GitHub desktop around. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. So I didn't even have the option of learning to use a tool like uh, a, a, a tool like GitHub Desktop. So I just didn't. Um, so I've never used it. So I don't know if it's easier or, or not. Certainly today, I'm taking a very low level approach and teaching you these command line uh, commands for using Git. Um, but I think what you'll find as you use Git, you'll fall into your own workflow um, where maybe you use tools like uh, GitHub Desktop um, and, um, and others. There's another tool called uh, Git, uh, Git Kraken, um, which is another uh, GUI editor for, um, for Windows that has a cool name. Um, but I haven't actually used this one either because I get by just fine with the commands I'm going to show you today typing in the terminal. But then I, I'm very comfortable in the terminal because I spend a lot of time working in the terminal and helping users in the terminal here at Calist on Ibex and Shaheen and things like that. But these are options that are out there. Um, I'll put links in the, the, the comment section on the, uh, on the YouTube uh, channel uh, when this video goes up to these these editor or these GUI editors and things. So I would encourage you to try them and um, see if you like them. And if you like them, use them. And you know, don't worry about the terminal. But today you're going to have to use the terminal. Um, right. Okay. So let's walk through this uh, this exercise uh, on places to create Git repositories. So um, 
Dracula, um, who you know hasn't uh, paid too much time and or hasn't bothered to properly learn Git, um, um, is uh, is saying, "Oh, we must create a GitHub repo or a Git repo inside every directory inside of our project." So if we have a new directory called moons. Um, I'll just, all right. So if we have this new directory called moons, then we need to CD into the moons directory and we should run the git init command here. This is what Dracula is, is claiming that we should do this. And by doing this, we create a new empty git repository inside the moons directory. And we should be doing this all the time for every directory. And Dracula is wrong. It is a um, uh, not a good idea. In fact, it's a um, it's not a good idea at all to create Git uh, repositories inside of Git repositories. There's no need to do that. So with Git, you can track folders and you can track files inside of all the subdirectories inside the directory in which the Git init command was run. So. If you think of planets as being our um, our project directory, our project root directory, then all we need to do is run the git init command to create this git repository once inside that directory. And then this will allow us to version control files in subdirectories, subdirectories of subdirectories, and so on and so forth. We can version control files inside the entire file system within our project directory. There's no need to run this git init command multiple times. So, but since we did it, we need to then undo it. So if we, um, so if we were to ls-la in the moons directory, so we've got this here. So we need to get rid of it. And the way we get rid of it is running uh, rm-rf um, and then dot git. And you need to be careful uh, when running um, with any um, with any recursive removal. Anytime you're running rn r, um, because it's going to go through the directory, uh, it's going to go through the file path that you provide and recursively remove files and directories. So if you run it in the wrong place, you could accidentally um, like this this command would cause you to blow away your entire file system. So you don't want to run that. So instead, what you want to do is just run the rm-rf on your .git directory. And now we've now our moons directory is empty again. And so we've undone the, the thing that Dracula had encouraged us to do, creating git repo or get repositories inside subdirectories. Right. Okay. So we're going to move right along. Just going to clear this again. Okay. So tracking changes. So in this uh, in this episode, we're going to learn how to track changes in Git um, and how to check the status of your uh, your Git repository. This is a Git status command. We're going to be using this a lot in this section. And then um, how to write commit messages. We're going to be like little notes about um, what changes you're making and why. Um, um, okay. So we're going to be working through. So a key objective is to go through this modify, add, and commit cycle for. Um, one file and then for multiple files at a time. And we'll kind of very slowly walk through where information is being stored at each stage in this modify add commit cycle. And then try to encourage you to write um, descriptive commit messages that explain why the change was made rather than non descriptive uh, commit messages, such as I fixed a typo or something like this with this change. So we'll see those in a minute. Okay, so we need to be in our planets directory. So uh, right now I'm in the moons directory, as you can see from the file path here. So I'm just going to move up to the parent directory. And we're going to create a file called mars.txt. Now, um, since we're in JupyterLab, um, 
I'm going to use the, uh, and we've talked about how to use Jupyter. I'm actually going to use the uh, file browser to create these files. So I'm going to go into, uh, click on the file browser to open it up. And then I'm going to go into introduction to Git, planets. Um, and then I'm going to click this launcher button here. And we're going to launch a, a text file. Yeah. So just to go through the sequence of commands again. So if you open the file browser, and then you can navigate, just double clicking into introduction to Git, into introduction to planets, and then you can um, open a launcher and uh, create a new file. So that's just creating another file. I think you might also be able to right click and create a new file. Um, so that might be the easier way to do it. Just right click and create a new file. Um, so I'll go back to this first first file that we uh, that we created, and we're going to rename this uh, to Mars.txt. So that was a, um, a right click and rename to Mars.txt. Now in the notes, the notes are using bash commands um, to to create these these as well. So you're welcome to use the bash commands to create. Uh, create the file um, as well. Okay, so inside mars.txt, we're going to add some content. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and then save it. And now if we go back to our terminal, um, let go away. So if we go back to our terminal, now we run ls-la, we'll see that we have this um, mars.txt file, which we just created. I had these other two text files that I, I happened to create um, and just demoing file creation. Um, we have this file, um, which is a checkpointing file used by Jupyter Lab, which gets created whenever you, so this is a directory, but uh, this directory is a Jupyter version control mechanism that gets automatically created whenever you uh, create uh, files and things like that. We don't need to worry about that for now. Um, so we can just ignore that. OK. So we can run cat on mars.txt, which is just going to dump the output of, it's a bit of a mess. Um, ah, I know why. Needed to add an end of line character into the mars.txt. So now, if I run cat mars.txt, we see that we get the content of the text file. Um, and then um, we get our prompt back. So that's, that's what cat does. So now, if we run git status, we can see that we have no commits yet, but we have this untracked files, which are highlighted in red. So these are files that Git understands are there, but knows that it's not tracking changes on these files. And it's kind of encouraging you to track changes in these files. So we're going to see how to do that. So to track, to tell Git that we want to track changes in a file, we have to add the file to Git. And it, Git tells you kind of that you might want to use this Git add command to track. So we're going to run Git add and then mars.txt. And now if we run git status again, we'll see that we have um, a new status of our repository. So git sees that we have added changes to be committed. Um, this file mars.txt is now marked as green. We have these other files and directories that are not being tracked. They're still marked as red. And then git is telling us what suggests some other commands. So it again says you can use this git add command to add more files. If you did not mean to add this, you could run this command, git remove cached file to remove the addition of this file and basically turn it from green back to red, okay? And it tells us that we have not committed anything yet. So we're not, the modify add commit cycle 
the, we've done the modify, we created a file, added some text in the file, we added it. So we now we need to commit it to complete the cycle. And that's what actually records the changes. It's the act of committing to a Git repository, repository that actually uh, saves the changes into the repository. So if we do Git commit, and then we're going to add a, um, a uh, dash M so that we can type our commit message. And our commit message needs to be short, but also describe what change, why we made this change. So um, started notes on Mars as a base. And then we remember we have our double quotes, our open and close double quotes around our commit message. And if we hit enter, we're told that um, we have one file that has been changed where we had one line of inserted text. And then we created this file mars.txt. And now this is our commit log for the Git repository. So we, now we have committed, we've done one iteration of the modify add commit cycle. We've added this file to Git. And now if we run Git status, we'll see that uh, we are now, we're still on our main branch um, and we have some untracked files, but there are no files that have been added um, and nothing to be committed. So now we've, we've done one iteration of modify add commit and we're gonna be doing this a lot. So Nora, so files are not automatically tracked in a Git repository. So no, that's very important. So Git will tell you that it can see all these files that are untracked and it'll usually mark them as red, um, but you have to manually add a file or files and then commit them until they are saved in the Git repository. That's very important. So um, Maram has a, a, a very good question about how regularly should we commit? Um, so the way to think about this is um, I try to commit often and group collection of collections of related changes to related files into single commits. But I try to keep those commits small. And the reason for that is if you work all day and um, you get to the end of the day and you haven't committed anything, but you're like, okay, I feel like I should commit and save my work before I go home. So you, uh, you commit and you save your work, you go home, you come back the next day and you realize that you had made a mistake. Well, now you either have to fix that mistake um, and add some more commits or you have to undo the changes that you made yesterday except the changes you made yesterday, undoing that commit will undo an entire day's worth of work. So if you keep your commits small, then if you ever make a mistake in a commit, you can easily um, what's called revert that commit. We'll see how to do that in a little bit um, and, uh, and fix the mistake without losing a whole bunch of work. So um, I should, Commit early and commit often um, would be um, my motto. And try to think of commits as capturing related changes. So even if you have made changes in like six different files, if those changes to those six different files are all related, then they should be together in the same commit. And we'll, we'll see how to commit multi multiple files in, in a minute. Um, Okay, um, so there's a command called git log, which will show you, so I'm gonna clear this out again. So if we run git log, uh, this shows you um, kind of the history of your commits from your most recent commit all the way back through the history. You could go all the way back to the beginning of your project. So here's our first commit. So there's you know nowhere else, else to go, but as we add more commits, this. Git log output is going to get longer and longer. 
So one of the things that you'll see here is that each commit has a unique identifier, which is called the commit hash. Um, it uses a hashing algorithm to um, uniquely create a unique identifier for each change, um, for each set of changes that you commit into the Git repository. And it's this unique identifier that allows you to kind of move back and forth from whatever the current state of your repository is to a previous state. And we'll see how to, how to do that uh, later this afternoon. But it's using these commit references that allow you to um, move back and forth. OK. So where are your changes? So we've made these changes. And, but where are these changes stored? So again, if we run ls-la, and we will see that you know, we have this mars.txt file here, um, and we made some changes to it. But I, at the very beginning, I said version control systems keep track of the base document and changes, and keep track of changes separately from the base document. So where are these separate changes being stored? Where are they kept track of? And the answer is in this .git um, directory. Um, so that's why when, we, um, when you remove that directory, you're essentially deleting the contents of your Git repository. And so that's why you have to be very careful when you remove that directory. There are a few times when you actually want to do that, um, but um, you don't want to accidentally delete that uh, because that would be, that's like the only way that you can, in my experience, the only way that I have ever lost work in a, um, in a project that I've been version controlling with Git is when very early on when I was learning to use Git, I accidentally removed the .git directory from a repository that had some history to it. And, um, and I lost that. Um, but if you are having local repositories that you're linking up with your repositories on GitHub, then it's almost impossible to completely lose the work because even if you lose your local copy, there will always be a remote copy that you could re-download again. So one of the major advantages of using GitHub and why we focus on that uh, later in this course is to help you provide that like second layer of protection from losing your own work, basically. Okay. All right, so let's go through this uh, modify add commit cycle again. So this time, instead of using the, um, the file browser, I'll just use the, um, um, the nano command to edit the file. So now if I do nano mars.txt, I can go in here and add, um, again, I'm just going to copy and paste. And then the keyboard shortcuts to get out of nano are, um, they're listed at the bottom. This, this caret is like the control key and then X for exit. So if you do control X, you'll be asked, do you want to save the modified file buffer? And you can just say Y for yes. And then it will ask you what file to write to. And I'll say the same file. So you just hit enter. And so that's like the command line way of editing a file. Um, and then again, if you were to open this file within JupyterLab, then you'll see that the changes are here as well. If you prefer to use the JupyterLab, like the GUI text editor to make these edits, then please, by all means, do that. Um, two ways of accomplishing the same task. So let's run our favorite git command, git status, again. So now we have modified changes in mars.txt. And git tells us that we need to add this file to get it ready to be committed. Or um, we can use a command called git restore if we want to discard the changes that we made. So sometimes you're going to make changes. And you're like, ah, I didn't mean to make that change. I want to roll it back. So before you've added it, you can roll back those changes by running this git restore command. Um, so 
Um, and I'll, I'll show some examples of that in a minute, but I want to focus on this modify add, add commit cycle now. Um, right. So when we've made changes, uh, so here's another git command. So if you want to look at the changes that have been made, you can use the git diff command and then pass in the file name. And then you will get um, a representation of what changes have been made. So in green, we have this um, new file or new line that's been added. And then we have um, um, a, um, a new line that has been moved down, which used to be here. And now it's here. Um, right. OK, so that and then um, we have some other information up here. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. OK, so let's add this to our, database, our, our Git repository. So if we do um, git commit, and then we type in a commit message, so, um, so added uh, concerns about, uh, about what was the little commit message that they used? All right. Uh, the effect of Mars on Wolfman will get um, kind of an error. Or it's not an error, but we're basically just told that you can't commit anything because you didn't add the file first. So this is kind of a uh, just a reminder that you have to, it's modify, add, commit. So you must add the file before you can commit it. And the, the reason for that is that you will often want to add multiple files to the same commit. And so if you didn't have this distinction between adding and committing, then there would be no way to add groups of, or the no way to commit changes to groups of files at the same time. So we're going to do git add mars.txt. And then I'll just press up twice to run the git commit again. And now we see the, the successful message that you get after you commit something. And if you were to run git log, you'll see that now we have two commits. So the most recent commit, and then the original commit that we made. So now we've gone through this modify add commit cycle twice. Okay. So here's a, a nice uh, uh, visual representation of what Git is doing. So when you make when you uh, modify a file or files and run the git add command, the git add command takes those changes, moves them inside the got the dot git directory to what's called the staging area, and the staging area is is where you can collect. Uh, changes from multiple files. Um, and then once you are ready, once you have all the changes that you want to include, then you can run the git commit. And that takes that collection of changes and adds it on top of the repository stack. And because the repository keeps this kind of um, uh, structure of commits from the very first commit to the second commit, the third commit, and so on and so forth. But the most recent commit is on the top. Um, then that's that's the right way to think about kind of what's going on inside of a Git repository. So uh, Farouk, yes. So right now we are working uh, locally. So all of the changes that are happening and that we've made are only stored locally inside of our, our Jupyter Lab uh, instance. We haven't saved them to GitHub yet. So we have to create an account on GitHub and link up this repository with that account. And we'll do that uh, later this afternoon. Um, and there's another question. So we did, so we, we added Mars again because we made changes to the file. So yes, it's the same file, but we made uh, we added more content. We added more text to the file. 
Okay. Um, uh, okay, so now let's make some, um, some more changes. So I'm going to open up uh, mars.txt again. And then we're going to add a third line. So now I've saved the changes that I just made to uh, mars.txt again. I'm just going to type clear because this uh, is get, getting a bit busy. Um, so now if we run um, git status, Again, we can see that this mars.txt has changed. So if we forgot the changes that we made, we could run git diff on mars.txt. And this tells us that, okay, well, you added this extra line of text here. So that's the difference between the file that is in the, the current directory and the version of this file that is stored in the git repository. Um, so let's add. Uh, add this file, so git add mars.txt. Um, and now um, if we run git diff again, there isn't any output this time. And the reason is that once we ran the git add command, we moved the changes from the inside of our current directory into the .git directory, which holds the repository. So the git diff command is always going to give us the difference between what is in our working directory and what the most recent version is available in the git repository. Um, so if we want to compare um, the difference between the version in our working directory and the version that's in the staging area in the git repository, we can add this staged modifier um, or option which gives us basically says that there is a version of mars.txt that is staged in the repository, but not yet committed that, um, and the difference between the version in the, um, the Git repository and the staged version is this extra line. Okay. So now we can commit, so Git commit, Um, discussed uh, concerns that money has. Got. Now here, uh, you'll notice that here my git commit messages are about as long as the changes I'm making to the file, which is, is an artifact of the fact that I'm you know, making little changes to, to demonstrate how to use the tool. Um, but in general, obviously, you might be changing you know, many lines or hundreds of lines of files and then adding a short you know, 50 to 100 character message about what that or why you made that change. OK, so now if we do git status, we've see, we can see that there are no um, changes to be committed. And we still have some untracked files, but, but that's about it. And if we run git log, we can see now that we have three commits, um, starting with the most recent and going all the way back to the very beginning of the repository. Um, there's some text box here that covers some, some kind of tips and tricks about different ways that you can um, um, set up to do the diff command. Um, by default, diff looks at um, compares lines that are different, but if you wanted to do um, uh, word-based diffing, you could do that by um, adding this option, color words. Um, some discussion about how to page through the log, how to use the space bar to page through the log. Um, as our log gets longer, it will come in pages and you'll need to kind of scroll through the log to view older and older commits. So you do that with the space bar, and then you can press Q to, um, to exit the, the log and go back to the prompt. I'll show you how to do that once we add some more commits. Um, you can limit the log size. You can you make the log look 
you know, differently formatted. Um, I'm not going to cover all the, the details of, of that. Um, so one thing that is important is, um, so Git tracks files, not directories. So you notice we've been adding, modifying, adding, and committing files. So if we want to create an empty directory and then try to add that to Git, it won't work. Like you have to have a file to add inside of that directory and then Git will, will pick up the directory. Um, so uh, one of the things that you can do is, um, for example, if we wanted, let's suppose we wanted to add a, um, a, uh, the moons directory uh, to our repository, but we, we weren't ready. We, we knew that we wanted this moons directory to be in the repository, but we didn't want, um, we didn't want to um, add any files to it. We can add this, um, a special file called git keep. So if we do, um, there's a command called touch, which you can use to create a, um, uh, to create a file. So if we did touch moons.git keep. So this is just going to create a uh, an empty file. Inside of this directory. And with the empty file with this special name, if you do get status, now Git actually sees this moons directory as being um, um, as being untracked, and we could do git add moons, and then git commit added a placeholder directory. And um, and now if we do git log, you can see that we have a new commit. So we've added this, this placeholder directory here. There's another slightly more involved example of, of doing the same thing here in the notes that you can look at. OK. So just to kind of wrap up, um, we have the modify, add, and commit cycle. So if you want to multiply, uh, you can use this modify add commit cycle to add one or more files or changes to one or more files into the staging area. So we can git add multiple files and then git commit the changes to those multiple files um, at, the, um, at the same time and add it as a single commit to our repository. OK, so there's a couple of questions in, in chat. So one is. Um, how can we go back to the first version of, of the file? So that's called reverting, and we're going to cover that in the next episode. And there's another question. So could you please explain the concept of touch and git keep once again? Sure. So the relevant section is, is this bit here on directories. So I, I use this technique when, um, well, for example, um, when I was creating the GitHub repository for this course. So I see I have all these directories in here. Some of the directories have files in them, but some of them are placeholder directories, like introduction to Git. So I, when I created this repository, I did a touch.git keep inside this directory and then added this to my repository so that I could have this placeholder directory and maintain this kind of structure in the GitHub repository for everyone. And the same thing here. So here's an example with um, so introduction to shell. So this has um, actually this is probably not a good example. Um, so yeah, so that's not a good example because uh, that one has has data. But then uh, introduction to Conda is also another one. So it has this dot git keep. So it's a, it's a way to kind of create um, a folder structure in your uh, GitHub repository or your Git repository that um, that you want to maintain, even though you're not ready to put files that you're going to version control in those those directories. Okay. 
Um, okay. So there are a, a couple of exercises here. So I'll give you um, a, uh, a few minutes to, to work on these exercises. So I would, um, particularly the, the last two exercises, so committing multiple files. So I'd like you to focus on those. So um, you know, practice adding some text to the mars.txt file and then create a new file, venus.txt, add some content to that file and then add both of those files um, into the staging area and then commit them together as a single commit. So we'll, we'll go through that one together, but I want you to really focus on that one. And then if you feel like you, you understand that exercise, then look at the bio repository, which will give you practice creating um, a new project or new directory outside of planets. So don't create it inside of planets. You know, go somewhere else outside of planets and create a, a new directory called bio, create a file in there, add some stuff about yourself and just practice like that process of creating a new project, creating a new Git repository, adding and committing files. Okay. So I'll set, um, I'll set my timer for that. And then, um, so off you go. So I'll give you about five minutes uh, to work on those two exercises. Uh, so in, just in case you're wondering, so my, my plan is to take a break at about three o'clock. So I would like to cover, we have um, the next episode is on um, exploring history and undoing and changes and undoing commits. And I would like to do that. Um, and then we will take a break. And uh, so that's the plan. So we will have a break in about uh, 25 minutes.
OK. So we're back. And let me share my screen again. OK, so I'm going to go over this um, committing multiple files. So I will let's go up here and I've got my Mars.txt open. So I'll add some text. So we are also going to consider Venus as a base, even though it is very hot. Okay. And I will control S to save that file. Uh, I'm going to clear. So now if I look at uh, the status. So I have mars.txt. So, but I want to create a new file. So um, called venus.txt. So I'm just going to rename this file that I created earlier. So I right clicked, renamed. I'll just call this venus.txt. So now um, if I run git status, so I can see I have this venus.txt file, but it's not tracked. So I'm going to open it up and add some text. So we are. Um, Definitely going to consider using Venus as a base. I'll just save those changes. Um, and now we can do git status. And so now we're ready to add. So if we do git add venus.txt, we can do git status again. And we can see that we have this brand new file that Git has um, automatically added. Um, and um, made it ready for uh, commit. Or sorry, we added, sorry, we added the file venus.txt. But we have not added the changes that we made to mars.txt. We need to add that. So if we could git add mars.txt, and now we do git status. So we can see here, we have two changes to two different files that are going to be added together in a single commit. And so now we can do git commit and our git commit message will be um, considering Venus as a base. And um, now if we do git status, we can see that we, um, we don't have anything to commit. And if we look at the log, we can see now that we have yet another commit added onto the top of the log. OK, so any questions about the modify add commit cycle before we move to, um, before we move to the, next, uh, the next episode? Nope. Okay, cool. So moving on. Oh, one question. Can we commit a subdirectory to Git? So um, if you want to com if you want to add uh, files within a subdirectory, then you can just get you can use git add to add those files and commit them just as we've been doing here. If you want to add an empty subdirectory to Git, then you need to look at um, this section here. That's what I was doing with this creating this kind of empty file dot git keep inside of an empty subdirectory and then adding that. So that's um, the two different ways that you would think about adding a subdirectory. Okay, moving on. Exploring history. So this is where we're going to talk about um, how to look through old versions of files and how to um, check out uh, older versions of files and put them from the repository history and then put them back and, and vice versa. Okay. So that's like the big objective for this episode is to show you how to restore old versions of your files if your newer versions have become, um, you know, broken or corrupted or for whatever reason. Okay. So let's clear this, this out. OK, um, so, so we're going to talk about how to undo changes. And so the first thing we need to do is to make a, um, 
a change that we want to undo. So in our mars.txt, I'm just going to close Venus. So in our mars.txt, let's add um, some a change that we will revert or that we'll undo. So we're going to add some ill-considered change that we uh, will want to undo. So I'll, I'll save that. And now if we do get status, we can see that uh, there have been modifications um, to the file, but nothing has been staged and nothing has been committed. So this is the, the modification step. We're still in the modification step of the modify add commit loop. Um, okay. So now let's do, um, let's use the git diff command to look at these changes that, that we've made. So if we do git diff, and instead of just doing um, git diff mars.txt like we've been doing, um, there's actually a second argument um, that, um, or there is an argument whose default value we've been using all along, which is that git diff compares the difference between two versions of a file and which versions you want to compare. By default, it will look at head, which is the version of the file in the, the most recent version of the Git repository. And it compares it, so that's the, the version here. And it will compare it with the version of the file in the working directory. But let's suppose we wanted to compare mars.txt in our working directory with an older version. So we can use um, a syntax, um, so head uh, tilde one to go back to not the most recent version of mars.txt in the Git repository, but the version just before that. So remember in the, 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 the picture in the previous episode, um, Actually, let me just go back to it. Um, so this picture in the previous episode, so head references this top of the stack here. Head tilde one references this here. Head tilde two references this one and so on and so forth. And so we can use this um, to uh, this head tilde notation to compare the version of, of a file in our working directory with a previous version in our Git repository. So you can see here, the head tilde one is comparing um, the version in the current repository, which has these two extra lines when compared against the version of that file at this point in the Git repository. And you can do the same. So we could go um, head tilde two. And head tilde, oh, head tilde three. head tilde four, it is like referring to the version by index, yes. Uh, head tilde five, and eventually we will get an error message. And the reason is that this is like an index, um, if you take it back to, so Amara mentioned, it's like uh, referencing an index into the repository. And that's a, a good way to think of it um, when you're doing this git diff command. But if you go too far, when you're indexing into something, if you go past the last index, you get an error. And so this is kind of the index error that you get if you go back too far in your Git repository. So previous to, uh, if we try to go five commits back from the previous uh, most recent version in the repository, we'll basically get to the commit where we created the initial file with this first line of text. And because um, remember, when we created this file, we created the file not as an empty file, but as a file with a single line of text. 
So we basically hit the end of the, the Git repository. Similarly, if we were to do git log, so, um, so here is uh, head, head tilde one commit, head tilde two commit, head tilde three commit, head tilde four. And then if we did head tilde five, we've run out of commits. We've gone all the way back to the beginning. And so that's why we get that error. Um, da, da, da. So we can also, so if we look at git log, so in addition to this head tilde, you can also uh, copy um, these commit identifiers, so these commit uh, hashes. So let's say we wanted to commit, um, let's say we wanted to compare the current version in our working directory with the version of the file in this commit. So if we copy this commit, we can do uh, git diff and we can paste the commit in and we can do mars.txt and then we'll get the diff, uh, the same output as if we had done um, head tilde one, tilde two. So head tilde two, I believe. So if we did git diff, head tilde two, yeah, we get the same output. So these, these two commands here are giving the same output, which is what, what we would expect. But you don't actually have to paste in this whole, um, this whole commit um, identifier. You just have to paste in enough to make it uniquely identifiable. So usually like the first, um, you know, seven or eight characters is enough. So if we should be able to do this. Yeah. And so that's enough to uniquely identify. And after, if we looked at the log, we could see if you, if you compare these commits, actually um, only one commit starts with an eight. So if we had just done uh, get uh, diff, you know, even this might work. Apparently that's not enough. So apparently we need to do uh, more eight, eight, let's see, three D nine, maybe that's enough. Yeah, so that's, that's enough. So the first five characters seems to be enough to do it. Uh, is there an option to compare it to the oldest version of the file? So this is a question from the chat. Um, so basically, uh, ooh, so that would be like negative indexing in Python. So like, could we compare it to the original version of the file um, and if we didn't know what that index was? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I've not, I've never been asked that before. Um, hmm. I wonder, I would doubt. So let's see how far we can push the, uh, the indexing um, idea. So if we do git diff head uh, tilde minus one and mars.txt. Yeah, so that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work. Um, hmm. I bet there is a way to do it, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. So um, I will have to look it up and see. And I would try using the help menu for the git diff command, but I know that the help menus are not working for subcommands. So, um, but now I'm intrigued because I think this was actually, this was a, um, a good question. So let me see. So what do we want to do? So you want to um, get uh, compare current version against oldest version in the repo. And Google looks like it hits us on, um,
Mm -hmm. This is not what we're uh, that we want. This is comparing the current version with the most recent version. We want um, so what with so let's see da, 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 da. <laughs> the third one is the exploring history version control with Git lessons that we're currently using. Hmm. So nothing, uh, nothing is coming up with a quick Google search. So I'll have to um, dig a bit deeper to try to figure out the answer to that question. But it is a very good question, um, and I could see why you would want to do it as well. Like if you, the, the only thing that I would know to do um, would be, you know, if you looked at the log. And then you went down to the end of the log, and then you just grabbed the first part of the uh, the commit hash for that commit, and then you could do git diff um, that I partial identifier with the file that you wanted to compare, and that would do it. Uh, Oh, so uh, Mohammed uh, Raith has a um, a link. How to get the git diff of the first commit? Uh, okay, so this is. Let's see. So git diff. Ah, so this is interesting. So. This answer on Stack Overflow is saying that there is a um, a unique identifier that's comp, but well, an identifier that's used in every Git repository um, to stand in for the empty uh, the empty tree in the em an empty Git repository. So if you were to do, I'm going to copy th this little identifier here. Let's see if this works. So if you do to Git diff. And then mars.txt. So this doesn't appear, appear to work anymore. So, which is kind of fine because that's a bit confusing way to think of it. Um, hmm. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a great way. Uh, to do it. So there's a, a way. Uh, so Mohammed Osman has suggested something in the chat. Um, but that looks a bit too far afield for where I, I don't want that. Will, you're welcome to try that command and see if it works. But I don't want to go too far afield um, and get, as you can already see, um, you know, Git is a very powerful tool, but it's also very um, complex. And so there are many little rabbit holes that you could get uh, run down and um, um, Oh, so uh, so you're saying that so Muhammad is saying that this works, but if you specify the whole com the whole commit, Rather than, uh, so let me just clear clear this out. So we want to compare. Um, so this is the the diff between using the identifier, but this is using that special identifier that, uh, according to our uh, friends at Stack Overflow, exists in every GitHub repository to point to as a way of identifying. The state of the repository when it was completely empty. And that that notice this gives us a slightly different answer because this is telling us that this is showing us um, the uh, the difference between. So this is not giving us exactly the same information. So this is giving us the information of the difference between um the current version of the file and a completely empty github repository or git repository which 
if you think about it, should just be what the contents of the current file are. So if you compare the current file as it is with the version of the Git repository when it was completely empty, then of course it's just going to be what you have in your current file, which is why we have all the content is green. So in that sense, it doesn't really seem terribly useful. Um, so the, but what is use very useful is this um, comparing different versions. And usually it's the most recent versions that you want to compare. Um, so yes, so Maram, we are going to have a break. Um, and I did want to take the break about now, um, but I am, hmm. We'll just take a break now um, for 20 minutes, and then I'll just pick up in the middle of this uh, this episode. I, I didn't get far enough along that I feel like I can push through to the end, and we're going to cover some important topics. So we'll just kind of pick up um, uh, kind of in the middle of this episode when we come back. So we'll have a 20 minute break, and we'll come back at around uh, 3.20. So I'm going to pause the recording for now and we'll pick up our recording when we're when we're done from break. Okay. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, we're just going to kind of jump back in and pick up where we left off. So we were in the middle of the um, exploring history um, part of the of the training. So let me share my screen again. So we were um, exploring history. So we showed, we, we talked a lot about how to compare um, uh, history, like the current versions of files versus older versions of files. So now we're gonna see how to revert um, changes. So if we run git status, so we have these modifications that we made in the mars.txt. And let's say that we recognize that before we had even staged any changes into the repository, um, that we, we, we wanna get rid of this change. We just wanted to revert. So we wanted to undo, undo basically this, this change that we made here. So uh, Git actually tells us the command uh, that, uh, that we can run. So if we run Git restore on the file, then this will get rid of the changes. Uh, actually, I need to close that. Um, but now if I open it again, then this will have gotten rid of the changes that were um, in that file. So now this ill-considered change is now gone. So that, that's important. So if you, uh, and now if we were to run git status again, you'll see that there's no difference between the version of mars.txt in the working directory and the version of mars.txt that was in the repository. And that we, we did that by running this git restore command. So that's quite nice. Um, it's a, a great way to undo changes that you've made um, before you have added them into the staging area. Okay. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to go back even further, so um, so let's look at. So uh, there's a question Marm is asking, so restoring after adding. So you would do, so you would do this if you added changes. Oh, sorry, sorry, restore after add. Yes, we're gonna talk about that. Sorry, I, my mind was not 100% uh, turned back on since coming back from break. We will talk about what to do after we've added in just a minute. So, um, if we want to go back to a previous version of the file, so if we look at our git log, let's say we wanted to go back to the version of the mars.txt uh, file in this version um, of, the, um, of the file, basically the file that was present at the time that this commit was made. So we can go back and we can copy that and then we can do um, git checkout. 
Um, actually, I wonder if I can do this with restore. So I'll try with this new restore command. No, so that didn't work. So we need to use um, we need to use the checkout command. Sorry, in between the, the version of Git on which the teaching notes are based and the newest version of Git, this um, restore command has been introduced. And so I haven't incorporated it into the text or the, the, the notes yet. So if we want to go back to an older version, we can do git checkout and then the commit identifier um, for the commit for the version of the file. Sorry. We provide the identifier of the commit that contains the version of the file that we want to check out. And when we do that, um, we will see, so let me get rid of that. If we open that up, so then this is the version of the file that was present in that commit. So now we've gone back to a previous uh, version. And if we do git status, we'll see that um, we have these changes that, um, that git has already added basically and is ready for us to, um, to commit them. So we can put things back the way they were by doing um, either uh, git restore chain staged, or we could do, as the notes say, git checkout head mars.txt. Now, if we do git status, there's no, now there's nothing to commit. So there are, there are two ways you can, uh, so you can use this checkout command to, to check out different versions of the file that you're, you're working on by either going into the log and copying a partial, um, section of the commit identifier and then doing git checkout that identifier the file or files that you want to check out or you can use the head uh head and head tilde indexing like syntax to check out versions based on on that kind of logic too so that allows you to move back and forward between different versions okay so here's a um Um, uh, here's a kind of a schematic of, uh, of that. Um, so you have your repository in the dot git directory and you're doing a, a git checkout head, uh, tilde one will replace the, uh, the files in your working directory with the versions of those same files that were in that commit. And you can also use the commit identifier um, to do that checkout as well. Yeah. So the difference between checkout and restore is that um, this restore command looks like it has been identified or has been added in a more recent version of Git um, to, um, to take care of um, as just another way to do this, basically. This git checkout uh, head. So in older versions of git, let me see if they have, yeah, in older versions of git, you would have uh, this suggested command, instead of git restore, they would have git checkout followed by two dashes followed by the file to discard changes in the working directory. 
And so I think they created this git restore command to avoid this slightly kind of clunky and a bit non-intuitive uh, syntax to restore the most recent version of the files from the repository. So git restore is just a replacement for this highlighted command here. But git checkout is the, the general command. Um, okay, so here's another kind of cartoon to kind of further hammer home the point of of, uh, of how Git works. So you add um, you add files into the staging area, um, and uh, and then once you've added files to the staging area, then you commit them, and the commit the committing of those staged changes creates a commit identifier and then adds it on top of the uh, the stack of commits which represents your um, your github repo or your git repository and when you check out um, older versions you can reference them by you know this head head tilde head tilde two tilde one tilde two and so forth or for the individual uh, commit identifiers and restore works for non-committed uh, changes only, yes. So we'll see what happens um, uh, in a minute when we have uh, added changes or when we have committed changes and what we need to do. OK. Um, now, if you want to. Um, so let's go through this. Uh, let's go through this again. So I'm going to add. Um, um, so re adding this ill uh, considered change. Oh, uh, cancel X. Uh, discard. I do not want to save that. Right. Um, all right. So now I'm confused myself. So I'm going to clear this out. And then I'm going to run git status to remind myself of where we are. And I'm going to run git log to remind myself. Right. Okay. So now what I want to do is now I want to go in here and re-add this ill-considered change. OK, I'll close that. So now if I run git status, I have this, uh, this modification. And then if I do git diff, I can see that, OK, so I re-added this ill-considered uh, Ill change. And I will put a empty line at the end of the file. Okay, okay, cool. So I just wanted to add that. So now let's um, let's see what happens if I add this change. So get add mars.txt. So now I've added this ill-considered change. Okay. And so now it's telling me, OK, so you've made these modifications. They're ready to be committed, but they've not been committed yet. At this point, I could still undo them using restore. So if I ran the um, git restore, staged command as it as it suggests here then this will um, unstage the changes oh, get restore I have to specify the file this will unstage the changes um, and put them back in the working directory yeah, but it hasn't note that it hasn't removed the ill-considered change. It just unstaged um, 
the changes. And so now if I do uh, git diff, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I meant to write git stats. It's getting a bit. So now I have unstaged the changes, but the ill-considered modification is still there. So now I need to run git restore again. And notice I'm just kind of following what git is suggesting. So git is now saying, okay, if you want to discard changes in the working directory, then you can run git restore. So I'm going to run git restore. And now that ill-considered change is gone. So that's how you can revert to ill-considered changes that you have added, but haven't yet committed. And then next we're going to talk about the committed, what happens if you accidentally commit stuff that you an ill-considered change. Okay, so I guess this is, you know, using Git can be tricky, but there's also good hints in the Git status um, command output to help you along the way. So if you ever feel like, ah, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what I should do next, you know, take a deep breath, run git status, and then just read carefully through here and think about what you want to do. So I was able to kind of undo those changes in two steps because, of course, I had to undo the, uh, the staged changes and bring them back into the working directory, and then I had to remove the modifications that had been made in the working directory based uh, and as the second step. So that was a two, two, use, two stage use of git restore. Okay. So now let's, um, I'm gonna close this and we'll go in and now um, going to add uh, an ill-considered change that will be committed. that I will accidentally commit. I'll save that. Okay, so then let's do git status. And now we're gonna do git add mars.txt and git commit mars.txt. And our commit message is going to be uh, accidentally committing uh, an ill-considered change. So uh, Dahlia is asking a question, what does untracked files mean? So the untracked files are the files that Git sees in our working directory that have not been um, added, for added to the Git repository. So this, this is just a file that I created earlier. Um, and then this is a, a directory that was created by Jupyter. Um, and we're going to ignore that in the next episode when I tell it, when I show you how to ignore things. So that's what untracked files means. Okay, so here we're going to now commit um, mars.txt. So this is our ill-considered change and we're going to commit it. So now if we look at our log, we can see that, okay, so our most recent commit means that we have accidentally committed our ill-considered change. Um, now, now in order to, um, now in order to undo this, we have to do a bit more work because now this change has made it into the, the repository. So the only way that we can um, undo it is to check out uh, is well there's two ways that we can undo it one we could add another commit that just undoes the uh, the change that we just made uh, or we can use revert um, so this exercise actually walks you through the the process um, 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 of reverting and explains the difference between git revert and git checkout. So, um, okay, so let's walk through this, this process. Um, 
of, of reversion. So if we wanted to undo this accidentally uh, committing an ill-considered change, so we could, um, we could open the file, we could remove the ill-considered change, we could add commit, and then that would, that would be a way to remove the ill-considered change without, um, without uh, reverting or undoing that, um, that commit. An alternative is that we could use the git checkout command and we could say, well, let's check out the version of mars.txt from this, um, this commit here, which is the commit before we committed you know, this ill-considered change. So if we were to do that, so I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so if we were to do git checkout um, this um, oh, I've accidentally done something that I didn't want to do. And there is a note about this here. Don't lose your head. So I accidentally have lost um, my head. So I will do git checkout main to get back. OK. Um, get status. OK, get log. Log. OK. So what I wanted to do was check out. So since I only changed mars.txt, I could also use the git checkout command to check out the version of mars.txt from the commit before I committed the ill-considered change. So that would be this commit here. So if I do git uh, checkout mars.txt, then if I do git status, so it's saying mars.txt has been modified and those modifications have then been added. And now it's asking if I want to commit. So if I look at the mars.txt, so now you can see that ill-considered change is gone. Um, and so now I could go ahead and do git commit um, undo uh, ill-considered change. And now if I look at uh, the log, so here I have a record of the fact that I undid the ill-considered change with a new commit. If I, now let's make um, yet another ill-considered change. So yet another ill-considered change. I'll save that. And now we'll go back here. So here I'm in this um, the pager for the log. So if you can press spacebar and go all the way to the end, and then you can press Q to quit and get out of the log and get back to the prompt. Okay. So um, now if I run git status, I have these modifications. So this is like yet another ill-considered change. So I'm going to add and commit this. So I'm going to do git add mars.txt and actually to prove my, to make my, the point I want to make here, I'm going to go into the Venus file and I'm going to make um, another ill considered change in a second file. Okay. And now I'm going to get add Venus and I'll do get status. Um, and so now I have um, changes to Venus that have uh, been added. Now I need to add the Mars. OK, 
Okay, now I'm going to get commit and my commit message is going to be made uh, ill considered changes to multiple files. Okay. Now, now I can do get status and it looks like everything is okay, but obviously I know I've made some mistakes. So if I look at the log, so now I have a commit that has changes of um, wh where I made bad changes to multiple files. And now I need to basically undo this commit. Now, the, the git checkout approach that I previously used doesn't work very well in this particular situation because now I have multiple files. So I either have to git checkout multiple files and then, um, um, and then you know, check them out to the versions that they want to be, want to, that I want them to be in, and then add and commit those, uh, those changes. What I really want to do is just revert this commit. It's like the undo, but for commits. And so that's the revert that we're going to talk about here. Um, so we are going to, you know, as this exercise says, the first step is to look into the history and find the commit ID um, that we want to revert. And uh, we want to revert this commit. So we're going to copy this commit. Okay. So then I'm going to clear this out and then we're going to do get revert and then paste the identifier of a commit that we want to uh, revert. Um, and I forgot to type my commit message. Now notice what happened when I forgot to type my commit message. Forgetting to type the commit message um, put me in a my default text editor and kind of pre-populated a suggested commit message. And I can either change this um, or I can just take the, um, the default commit message and use that. So this is what happens if you forget to add the dash M and then type a little commit message. Okay, and so now if I do um, uh, git log, I'll see that I have a git com a commit that reverts this previous commit. And you can even see in the log like what has happened. So this reverts you know, this commit message here. And then it gives you the commit identifier of the commit that was reverted. And then if we look at um, mars.txt and venus.txt, those ill-considered changes are now gone. So um, let's sum up this, this undo um, process. So if you make modifications that you um, want to get rid of and you haven't, you've not added or committed them, you can use git restore. If you have made um, changes that you want to undo, but you've already added them, then you need to do git restore dash dash staged and then git restore. So it's a two-step process. If you want to undo changes that you've committed, the best thing to do is to do git revert. And then that git revert and then the commit ID that you want to revert will kind of rewind the history to the versions of files that existed before that commit was made. So there's a lot going on there. That's a, a very, reverting commits is one of the most tricky things that you will. Um... So Dahlia is saying, so basically revert is like check out to old commit and add and commit uh, undo. So yes, that's, that's a good way to think about revert. So it's like the undo. Um, and you can do git revert, um, you know, multiple. So um, 
to older changes. So let's say that we wanted to go, if you wanted to go all the way back to this commit, then you could do git revert, and then you would copy this commit identifier here, and it would rewind the git repo to the versions of the files that existed uh, prior to this commit. And then it would um, add a new commit to kind of save those versions of the files as the most recent versions. So that's what it's meant that this git revert is like the ultimate undo button. It's what allows you to kind of move back to any particular um, previous version of the files in your project. But it's best to try to identify bad changes early. So it would be better if we hadn't committed any bad changes to begin with, and we could have just kind of undone, undone things using git restore. Um, but um, if you do com commit um, you know, ill-considered changes, then you can just revert them. OK. Um, and there's some more exercises here, which I'll leave in the interest of time. I'll, I'll leave those as um, 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 as exercises for you guys to do at home. So Dahlia is asking, what is the difference between restore soft and restore hard? Is that in the notes somewhere, or are you? Uh, because I I'm a little bit unfamiliar with the git restore command. I'm used to using git checkout all the time. Um, and I don't think the help menus are here. So I will have to use Google. So let's do git restore soft versus hard. Uh, no, that's git reset, git reset. All right, let's just do this, git restore. and the documentation. So git restore and options. I'm not seeing a soft or hard option for restore. Are you sure it's restore that you're that you're interested in or is it um, some other git command? Because I'm not seeing those as being options. Um, maybe git reset has soft and hard. Uh, it must be git reset. So here's git reset. And then there's soft um, and hard options. And so this is a command that I don't use um, that often. So one of the things that you'll find about Git is that um, there is a huge number of, of commands. And the reality is, is that you will need to only know maybe like five or six of them. So there's Git add, Git commit, um, Git checkout, and Git revert. That's four. So those are the four, and Git init is five. And when we start talking about GitHub repos, Git push and Git pull, so that's seven. So there are only seven commands from Git that I use. I won't say ever. Oh, log, thank you, eight. And diff, nine, sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, and I would say probably 90% of the work that I do in Git is done with those nine commands. So less than 10 commands will get you more than 90% of the way there. Um, and the, the rest of the, the complexity of, of the Git user interface is rarely needed. And if you do need it, you can kind of Google for it and, and work out what it does. So don't get intimidated by this huge number of of commands. I mean, I, again, I have like about 10 commands that I use on a daily basis and anything outside of those 10 commands, I have to Google and look at Stack Overflow and things like that to figure out what they do. 
So I'll put a link to this. I'll leave this up here to put a link to the uh, the Git documentation um, um, in the YouTube video so that you can uh, have access to this as well. OK, uh, so let's clear this. All right, so let's move on to the next episode. So this next episode is about how to ignore things. So sometimes there's stuff that you um, that is going to be in your project that you don't want, um, you know that you don't want to add it to version control. And therefore, you don't want to be constantly told by Git that you have all these untracked files that you definitely don't want to track. So to, you can ignore them. So a common thing to ignore is data files. So you might think, oh my gosh, data is very important. Of course, I should want to version control my data so I never lose it. The reality is that Git is not designed to version control your 10 gigabyte CSV file. Like that's not what Git is meant to do. So it, yes, you should, you should version, you should be careful about um, you know, protecting your data, but there are other tools for that. You know, there are um, you know, basically data backup tools that you can use. There are uh, storing copies of your data in, in, uh, in various cloud repositories as possible these days and is either free or, or very cheap unless you have really, really large data sets. Um, but in general, you are not going to be version controlling um, your data files. Um, except in like examples where I'm like for my teaching, I will sometimes add CSV files directly into Git repositories just as a way to share them. So for example, last, uh, last week in the Python course, I had version controlled the CSV files that we were using in the data analysis sections. But that was just as a mechanism to share those files with you. And they're really small, like a few mega, a few hundred megabytes or something at most. Um, but for big files, like you don't want a version control. So let's see how we could ignore them. So let's um, let's make a directory called uh, results, and um, inside this results directory, we're just going to touch a few files. So we're going to touch results um, a dot dat. Um, and oh, actually, sorry, we're going to touch um, some data files. So um, a dot dat, b dot dat, c dot dat, and then some results uh, a dot out and results b dot out. And is there? That's it. Okay. So we're we're basically just going to create some empty files, and I'm going to show you how to ignore them. OK. And so we refresh here. So here are these files that we created, a, b, and c dot dat. And then in the results, we have these empty files, a dot out and b dot out. OK. Now, if we run git status, we'll see that we have these untracked files, untracked files here, and untracked files in the results directory. So. Um, what we want to do is um, we want to tell Git to ignore um, these uh, data files. And we want to um, ignore files in the results directory. Okay, So the way that we can do that is by adding a special file called .git ignore. So if I do, I'll just use the, the nano text editor to create a file called .git ignore. And you have to remember that to spell it exactly like this. So git ignore, all one word. And you have to remember to put the dot in front of it to make it kind of a, a special hidden file. So the, this file name is special in the git universe. So when we add things to this file, it's what git will then ignore uh, any files that match the patterns that are put in, these in, in this file. So for example, we want to ex ignore anything that ends in dot dat. And we want to ignore anything in the results directory. So we can just put these um, patterns in here. If we wanted to ignore, um, also, we can put a comment in here and say we want to uh, ignore um, uh, IPython checkpoints 
directory. And now we can add this, um, this dot I pi NB checkpoints directory that has been sitting in our untracked file since the beginning of today. And now if we save this with a control X and hit Y for yes and enter, then if we do get status, then we have a lot of changes here. So now we're no longer even seeing these at all. And our dot get ignore file shows up. So we need to add and commit that. And then we just have this untitled text file that I created earlier, which I will just um, now delete. Um, so the question is, what happens if we omit the slash? Uh, well, let's omit the slash and see what happens. So let's go back into our .git ignore file and then just remove the slash. And now if we do git status, nothing happens. So we don't actually need the slash. Uh, we can have the slash or not. I would probably try to remember to add the slash because with the slash this clearly tells me that i'm ignoring an entire directory um and so i would like to have the slash there to differentiate ignoring whole directories versus differentiating ignoring files but it's clearly not necessary okay and so we can do git add dot git ignore git commit and the commit message is now we are ignoring files. Okay. And we can look at the log. And um, there's our, our commit. Okay. Um, so there's a few exercises here. So I'll let you get some practice. So I'll set a, a timer for maybe three minutes and then take a look at some of these exercises. They're just basically practice, add, practice adding patterns in the dot get ignore file to ignore different kinds of files, things like this. Um, some of them actually want you to, to, you know, are interactive and want you to type some stuff. Some, um, um, so this is a, uh, so this is a good one. So ignore nested files and a different way of ignoring nested files. It shows you how um, to use the not operator to um, ignore, instead of you, you pass in a pattern and say, instead of saying ignore things that match this pattern, you say ignore things that don't match this pattern. And um, that's the exclamation point um, operator. So get some practice with that. I'll probably do one of these nested variation or nested files with the not operator just to show you how it, how it goes. Um, but have a crack at those exercises and we'll come back in um, a few minutes. And as always, you know, continue to ask questions if you have any questions. So I'm just looking ahead a little bit and keeping an eye on the time. So the next episode is about remotes in GitHub. So now would be a good time to um, remind everyone, if you do not have a GitHub account, um, it would now would be a good opportunity to create one. Um, if, you, um, if you would like to participate in linking up this repo that we've created with GitHub. Um, if you just kind of want to sit back and watch, you can do that too. Um, but if you want to participate and actually add this repository to GitHub and push changes and, and pull some changes, then, um, then you're going to need to have a GitHub account.
And just looking at the time, I'm guessing that we'll, we will get through the next episode on remotes in GitHub. And then I don't know how much further we're going to get past that. Um, we'll see, because I do want to talk some about open science and, um, and uh, licensing and hosting and things like that. So. I'm just going to step out for a moment, though. I'll be right back. OK. Um, I'm back. And So Farouk has a great question. So is it good practice to always add the virtual environment folder in Conda Workshop to get ignore? Yes. But what you will see is that the reason that I use the um, ENV as the convention for the subdirectory in your project directory that, um, um, that you create your Conda environment in is because the default dot get ignore files for Python projects, which you get from GitHub, automatically ignores that directory. So if you are creating your own get ignore file, then you should definitely add the env directory to your dot get ignore file to ignore the conda directory. Because the conda directory is going to have gigabytes and gigabytes of files, and you there's no point in version controlling them. But you should version control the environment file. That you definitely want to version control because as long as you version control the environment file, you can always recreate your content environment from that file. So that's a great reminder. So that there's a, a call out box in the Conda teaching notes on exactly that topic. Um, but I'm glad that Farouk, thank you for bringing it up. Um, I probably would have forgotten to mention that. Okay. But now in the interest of time, I do want to move on to the, the GitHub section. So I, we can, um, kind of end the, the Git portion of, of today by showing you how to connect your local repository to GitHub and push and pull changes. And then you basically got, you know, other than um, dealing with conflict and collaboration, uh, we will have covered um, all of the key topics on how to use Git um, for your, to manage your, your workflows. Um, okay. Okay. So let me share my screen. And uh, so let's go ahead and skip ahead to remotes in GitHub. OK. So we are, let's see. Now I just need to check and remember uh, what, or what GitHub account I'm logged in under. OK, so I need to uh, sign out and then sign in under my different IBEX training account. Okay. Um, so you'll need to go to GitHub and sign into your GitHub account. That's what I just did um, with uh, a different account than the one that I was currently signed in under. Um, it's very common to have multiple GitHub accounts. Um, often, if you have a um, you know, as you develop personal projects on GitHub, you have your own personal GitHub account. If you work for an organization um, that uses Git and GitHub, then that's awesome. And you will probably have to have your own like GitHub account that's specifically for contributions to work that you're doing to keep it separate from your personal GitHub account. Um, when you're doing academic research, it's not such a big deal, but if you're working and private companies, they will often want you to have a separate GitHub account for your own work with the company versus the GitHub account that you might be using for your own personal work. Um, and I have a separate GitHub account from my personal account that I use for training, like today. Um, 
Okay, so you're gonna to need to get up account. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a repository on GitHub now. So if you come up here to the top right hand uh, corner, you'll see this little plus button and with a little drop down arrow. So if you click on this, you'll be given an option. Do you want to create a new repository? Do you want to import a repository? Do you want to create a new gist, new project, new organization? What do you want to do? We want to create a new repository. Okay. Um, there's a concept of template repositories. So we're not going to create a repository from a template. So we just leave that at no template. And we're going to create it as you know, your user, um, your username on GitHub. And then here we will put um, uh, um, the name and we'll call of the repository, which we'll call plans. And then as a description, you don't have to put a description, but we'll go ahead and put um, um, uh, what will we put? So uh, remote repository for our Git training course. OK, now um, you can make it public or private. Um, you know, GitHub will support unlimited private repositories. Um, so if you want to use GitHub as a, um, as a extra backup for your Git repositories, but without making them public and sharing them with other people, then that's totally fine. You can just click private. We're going to click public, um, right now. Uh, and then that's it. So we don't want to add any of these things. Um, because we've already created our Git repository on our local machine. And we want to kind of link that local repository with a version on, um, on GitHub. So we basically just want a completely empty repository. If you're, a complete, if you're creating a, a, new, a completely new repository for a new project from scratch, then I would probably add a readme, add a git ignore, choose a license. I'll talk about some of those things. Um, and the last part of, of today. But for now, we're not going to tick any of those boxes. So just click public and then click create repository. OK. Uh, got it. So now we're given some instructions of, um, of what to do. So here are instructions for creating a new repository on the command line, a new local repository. So we don't need to do this because we have already um, uh, we have already uh, done it. So we've been creating this the planets repository um, all afternoon. What we want to do is push an existing repository from the command line. And so here we have um, a uh, here we have three commands that we should just copy. And then we go to our local repository. Out, and then we can paste them. And so the first command added the URL to the remote GitHub, the remote repository on GitHub as a um, um, as something called origin. So this is a shorthand reference to particular remote. So you can have multiple remote repositories for the same local repository, but the main one is typically called origin and it's associated with a particular URL to a Git repository. And then this command um, basically sets the branch as main because we're using main as the, um, the name of the branch um, on our local repository. And then this git push command is what is going to push the, um, the local contents of our repository up to GitHub. And this dash u uh, is just there to kind of create a link between the two branches. So we do this. And you're going to be asked for a username. Um, and you're going to need to put your username. And you're going to be asked for a password. And um, now I have to 
uh, remember what my password is for this training account, which I haven't used in a while. And that's what you get if you get an invalid password. So if you bear with me, um, I'm actually going to have to look up on another another. I just need to look up what this this password is. I'm still here. I'm just da, 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 da. So hopefully, if you put in your username and password, then it should work for you. So while I'm <laughs> while I'm searching for the password for this uh, for this training account, um, can if you go to participants, I'm just curious has any has this worked for anybody? So I just want to make sure that at least some of you are are, are able to have this um, have this uh, have this work. So if you could check yes in participants or just go to chat and say, yeah, yeah, it's working, uh, then that will help me know that. Uh -huh. Okay. Now I'm now I've sorted this out. Let's see if anybody's been successful. Yeah, so if you've so Mohammed has said he's lost his binder session. Don't worry about it at this point. We're you know 25 minutes from the end, so just kind of relax and just enjoy the rest of the uh, the rest of the workshop and don't try to get restarted and get caught up at this point. So uh, Ahmed seems to have gotten it. So let's, um, let me do this again. So OK. 
Okay, so now I gotta get my password correct. Try one more time and then I'll switch accounts. Huzzah! Hey. Okay, so now once that has completed properly, then um, if you go here and you refresh, you would see something like this. So you will have uh, a complete copy of all the files that you have created, but now as a repository on um, um, on your account on GitHub. Okay, sorry that that took so long. It's a bit embarrassing not being able to both remember and then type correctly your password after several attempts. Um, but that is a good example of why you should use SSH keys uh, to manage these types of connections, which is uh, a bit beyond the scope of the training today. Um, but we will probably have some videos on our YouTube channel about how to create SSH keys for your, uh, for your accounts um, on GitHub. So look out for those. Okay. All right, so we did that. And so when we, those commands that we ran on GitHub effectively created, uh, effectively ran these kinds of uh, commands on GitHub servers. So it made a plant's directory, it changed into director, that directory ran the git init command. And then when we pushed um, our, um, we pushed our, but okay, let me back up. So when we did that though, we had this kind of situation. So we had on our local uh, repository, we had you know some repository that had a whole bunch of changes in it and um, things. But on GitHub, we only had this empty repository. So when we pushed those changes um, using the suggested commands, so we then pushed all of these changes here up to this empty Git repository. And so we made with them uh, the same. And so just to walk through those commands, so the first command that we ran was this git remote add origin. So we did that. And then you know, we can run a, a command, clear this out, called git remote dash v, which will show you the remotes that you've added. So we have the single remote here, which is basically a URL to the git repository on GitHub. And then um, when we ran this git push command, we pushed our changes again from our local repository up to up to GitHub. Uh, some stuff about uh, password managers, which would have been really useful for me, so I wouldn't have had to uh, embarrassingly mistype my own password several times. Um, 
and there's a discussion of the dash u flag, um, which um, you can read about in the git push, uh, push documentation. It just associates your current branch with a branch on the remote. Um, okay. Um, now we can pull changes. So if there were some changes on GitHub that we wanted to pull down, we could pull them. So we could get, get pull from the origin re remote, the main branch. And uh, uh, this is some hint, which you know, we can ignore. Um, we can ignore from now. So it's already up to date. Okay. So if we go to our planets, so GitHub actually has the ability to edit and add files um, and things like that. So let's let's go ahead and, and add a readme. So if we click this add a readme button, then we can go in here and we can just add some some text. So uh, this is me creating uh, changes to the readme file. That I, whoop, that I will then pull down to our local repo. Then we can go down here and we can add a new commit. So we'll say, um, you know, added. Um, so why I made this commit was that I uh, wanted to demo the git pull commit. And we can commit directly to the main branch. So we'll just commit our new file. And so now we have this readme file here. So, but now this is a change that's on our remote that isn't present on our local version. So now if we do git pull, then um, we will get these changes. And now here's this readme file that has the same contents, including the changes that we just made on GitHub. And if we were to look at the log, so the most recent change is the commit that we actually made um, on GitHub. Yep, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that's all I want to cover about, about GitHub. Um, basically, I wanted to show you how to link up your GitHub uh, remote repository with um, a local repository and then um, push and pull changes. Um, there's, a, I think, a lot more that could be said about GitHub. There's, there's whole training courses on, on how to do things on GitHub um, that are available. And I would encourage you to look into those if you want to know how to fully um, use GitHub. So uh, Maram is asking, so we didn't talk about branches. So yes, we're not going to cover branches. Branches is a more advanced Git workflow um, topic, and it's hard to fit into this kind of basic session. But um, branches would be, um, I will put some links to uh, uh, some more advanced or intermediate Git notes that talk about how to do um, um, how to do uh, workflows with branching. So I'll make a note to add some links in the uh, description section of the YouTube video when I post this um, with links to those more advanced uh, advanced training materials. So. Um, uh, Haritha is asking, how do we return to the Git mode, which is not linked to the web version? So um, once you have once you have linked your local and your remote repository, the if you want to unlink them, you would have to remove the remote. Um, so if you um, so you can basically, you could remove the remote URL and that would break the connection between your local and your remote um, repository. So uh, Mohammed is asking a question about merging changes. 
So that's a great question. So merging changes and managing conflict is in, um, so let's actually take a look at what we have left, uh, left to cover today. So there are two lessons on collaborating and conflict that I don't think we're going, we're, we're not going to be able to cover today. Um, I want to spend uh, the next 15 or 20 minutes talking a little bit about open science, licensing, citation, and hosting. And so these episodes eight and nine have the answers to your questions on, on merging changes and managing conflict. But unfortunately, I don't, I'm not going to be able to, to cover them uh, in the time that we have today. OK. OK, so I, I think that kind of ends the like super technical portion of of the discussion today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, um, open science and um, and then about licensing issues and, and things like that, just to kind of bring some bring some issues to your attention that you can go off and explore a little bit more, maybe ask people at um, um, well, if you're here at CAUS, you can ask me for more details um, or talk to your PIs or your colleagues, or, or you can do the same if you're, you know, somewhere else. Um, so, right. Okay. So, open science. So, um, we're talking a little bit about how version control can help make your work more open. Um, and to think about how you can use version control, even if you're not using version control as a, as a way to collaborate um, and, like, um, with uh, research peers or, or colleagues or coworkers, um, you can still use version control to collaborate with like yourself on your own research projects. And what I mean by collaborating with yourself is that with version control, using version control, you have this like complete record of all the changes that you've ever made on your project, which makes it a lot easier for future you to you know, come back and find uh, find previous versions of your work that you might need at some point in the future. So it's a really good way to help help keep yourself more organized, um, which is kind of a, a better way of collaborating with yourself if you want to think of it that way. So, um, okay. So, but uh, open science and version control. So it would be ideal, I, I think, from a kind of a R and research and development scientific perspective, if um, you know information was completely freely available and shared with everybody, or at least as widely as possible. Um, and that's often taught as kind of like an ideal way to think about what science is and how science is done. Um, but in practice, things are a little bit more um, uh, more complicated. So. A more typical workflow is that a scientist is going to collect some data, store it on a machine, you know, their laptop or workstation. That machine is going to be occasionally backed up by their IT department. Um, you know, she's going to write some, uh, write some new programs uh, herself, or maybe modify a few small programs that she inherited from some previous student or or faculty member to analyze that data. She's going to get some results, write up results, submit a paper. Maybe she has to include the, the paper along with the data. Um, many journals now require this, but not all of them. Uh, relatively few journals require that you submit your source code that you use to obtain the results that are written about in your paper, but a growing number are um, requiring the use or requiring you to submit source code. Then you submit all these to a journal, some time passes, Journal editors get back to her with reviews. They ask for revisions. They ask you to make some changes. Changes are made to these scripts. Revisions are resubmitted. More time passes. Eventually, the thing, the paper gets published. Maybe there's a link to an online copy of the data, um, but the published paper is probably sitting behind some firewall where you need a subscription to access access the actually published version of the paper, and that's kind of where a research, where research paper ends at that point. And that's not very satisfactory for a number of reasons. Uh, I remember when I was, um, 
when I was uh, in grad school trying to replicate published papers. And it's actually very difficult to replicate um, replicate published uh, published journal articles. Often the, the information or the data or the code that is made available is insufficient to actually just run it and replicate the results in the paper. Um, and so using tools like Git, GitHub to version control your scripts, being able to share your GitHub, your Git repositories via GitHub with your collaborators, tools like Binder that allow you to describe a computational environment and then add a button in your GitHub repository that you can click to launch a, um, a computational environment that you use to generate the results of your paper. All of these things are um, massive improvements in terms of reproducibility of scientific research. So the fact that you're sitting in on this course and getting familiar with, with all of these tools, um, including Binder and Binder Hub and, and Git and GitHub, things like that are making you a much um, better scientist kind of full stop. So you, you should pat yourself on the back, I think, for sitting through these, uh, through these courses. Um, now, more recently, things have been changing for the better. And there are a large number of, of kind of tools and um, websites that are coming up to help researchers be more, more productive and more open and, and generate more reproducible work. So there are um, open uh, access repositories like Figshare and Zenodo where uh, you can store your data. And this would be data that you want to make uh, available for people who want to, who you want to be able to replicate your, your work and reproduce your work as quickly as possible. Um, and so Figshare and Zenodo are, are two uh, platforms for doing that. So Zenodo is the one that I'm most familiar with. So Zenodo emerged from the, uh, the CERN project and um, that's the, the big, uh, um, uh, particle accelerator in uh, Switzerland. So they had a, they were generating huge amounts of data and they had a requirement from their government funders that they would have to archive this data. And so they had to create an entire infrastructure to support that. And Zenodo emerged as an open source tool to allow others to leverage the data storage infrastructure that they have created to store their own scientific data. So basically, if you use Zenodo, you can store your uh, scientific data that you use to generate your papers or your research on, Z on CERN's infrastructure um, and therefore avoid the, all the cost and complexity of having to deal with this yourself. Um, with using tools like Figshare and Zenodo, you can get what's called a digital object identifier, which is a unique identifier for your data set. And that allows um, it, people, other researchers, other scientists to cite your data set in addition to your paper. And um, since citation counts are very important in the academic world, citation counts are computed based on digital object identifiers. So if, you're, if your paper has a digital object identifier and your source code has a digital object identifier and your data set has a digital object identifier, all of these things are research products that can be citable um, by others. And they help make your work more, again, more reproducible and kind of more open. Um, many people are using uh, GitHub to share their work. This is particularly um, becoming kind of the standard practice in the machine learning, data science, deep learning um, areas of, of academia. Um, GitHub has become kind of the de facto standard for sharing your work when you publish a paper um, in, uh, in a conference. Um, so Ahmed is asking a question about what is the space capacity of Zenodo? So I believe it's like, um, um, uh, they, they store data sets that are in the petabyte range um, on Zenodo. Um, I mean, it, it's quite enormous. Um, and now if you are an institution and you are storing like uh, large amounts of data sets, particularly for um, your uh, like, you know, 
a you know a university or a business or something like that, then they might have a different way of, of working with you. But I am unaware of any significantly binding constraints for uh, space capacity for individual researchers on Zenodo. Um, okay. So, so you're using Git and GitHub to manage your work. Um, when your paper is ready, you kind of post a, a preprint on Archive. So Archive is a great um, um, place to start searching for um, kind of preprints. So these are versions of papers that are published here are um, papers that are the, basically the last version before it goes to the journal and might end up behind a paywall. Um, but they are um, near finished research in most cases. In some cases, people will just throw up a you know a PDF that they uh, that they put together. And again, like there's a a notice here that archive preprints are not peer reviewed in any way. Um, so that would be, in some sense, you might say, well, that's the big difference between you know a published paper that has been peer reviewed and a paper that's published on archive. And that's true, but at the same point, for papers that have been published, you can find a freely available, basically final product on archive in many instances. So it's a good thing to, a good place to be um, knowledgeable of. So, and I guess the the big takeaway from this is that the open science model it accelerates discovery, it accelerates. Um, uh, you know, research and development, and more open work is more widely cited and more often reused. And this, I think, for me, is the, is the real key. And there have been a number of published studies now on this, that if you work in a more open, more transparent way, where you share your, um, your, um, your data, your research, your code with other people, your work is going to become uh, is going to gain more, more notoriety. It'll be more widely cited. It'll be more often, and it'll be more uh, often reused. And that's kind of, in some sense, like the whole point of why you're doing what you're do what you're doing when you're doing kind of research and um, and things like this. Um, there's a link here to uh, um, a nice book that goes into more details on the different aspects of of open science. Um, so. It's good, after you've gone through this course, it'd be good to kind of sit down and try to think about how reproducible is your own work. So, you know, I'm trying to provide training that is going to nudge you more towards working like this, or at least provide you with the tools that you need to start working like this. But, you know, it's likely that, you know, many of you might be working more like this. And that's okay. I mean, the, the point is to try to provide you with the tools and techniques that you need to kind of be more open with your, uh, your research processes if you choose to do so. So that's... Um, so there's some neat links here, um, including some other data repositories recommended by the journal Nature. Um, and then some discussions here about Git large file storage. So um, this Git large file storage is a, a, an extension tool for Git that allows you to um, kind of version control very large files in a sensible way. Um, if you wanted to, uh, so it's something that you can experiment with. You could download it and install it and play around with using it to version control larger files. Um, okay. So licensing, right? Um, so what license information should you include uh, with your work? And I want to, so I want to kind of answer that question and give you some links to go for um, information on how to think about what license you should choose for, for projects. So it's, it's very, very important that, um, um, that you put a license in every GitHub repository, every Git repository that you put on GitHub, you need to put a license with it. And the, the reason is that, um, well, A, like if you want people to 
try to reuse or reproduce like the work that you have, putting a license in there makes it clear under what terms that they are allowed to do that. And if they don't, if there is no license, then there is no explanation of the terms under which you can reuse the, the, um, uh, the code. And therefore most people will not use code that doesn't have a license associated with it. Um, so typically you would include a license as a, in this license or a license.txt file. So if I was to go to, I'll just go to GitHub now and uh, I'll create a new repository and I'll call this, um, to, I'll just call this um, example repository and just a repo to show how to choose a license. Actually, I'll call this an example Python repository. So I'll show you how to make a new, like how I would make a new um, uh, repository if I was going to start a brand new Python project. So demo creation of a new Python project. Okay, so I'll make it a public. So I will add a readme. I will add a git ignore. And for the git ignore template, I will search for Python. And then I will add a license. Okay. And there are many different licenses to choose from. So there's a link over here to choosealicense.com, which is a tool that Google or GitHub, sorry, put together to try to help you choose a license. So, and they kind of have three paths that they think about that you might want to head down. So the first is I need to work within a particular community. And so what that means is like, you're gonna work within the Python community or within the R community or the Java community or JavaScript or something like that. And typically there are standard licenses that are widely used with those, um, with those communities. And you probably want to use that license that is commonly used within that community unless you have a good reason not to. So for example, if you look at the different communities, so there's some, um, some links here to um, um, some different examples, like uh, they don't have unmute. Okay, so I just lost my, I guess, internet connection momentarily. Um, it seems to be back now. Um, so sorry for that. Not exactly sure what happened, but I guess I just lost my internet connection. So let me share my screen again. Um, okay, so I was talking about licenses. So uh, there's not a link to Python here, um, but Python predominantly uses uh, BSD3 clause um, or MIT. So I'll just select the BSD3 clause and I'll create this repository. Um, and go back. So another, so another option is the simpler permissive. So the MIT license is basically um, super open, pretty much let, it reserves you the copyright, requires that people attribute um, the work to you. But then other than that kind of lets people do whatever they want, including taking your, your source code and distributing it as a closed source, making changes to it and distributing it as a closed source version but they have to you know, uh, maintain your copyright and attribute the, um, um, like where the software came from. If you really want to make sure that improvements are shared, then you know, there's a uh, GNU GPL version three license, which allows people to do mostly what they want, except they're not allowed to distribute closed source versions. So if you create a, uh, so now back to the, now that this repo is created. So I, whenever I create, start a new project, I follow, uh, I go to GitHub, I create a new repository like I just did. I add a git ignore file for Python. I'll add a license that usually BSD3, and then I'll add a readme. And I mean, you can look at the text of the license. So it's a bit of legalese. Um, you want to, so by default, Google or, GitHub will put in your username as being the user 
who has the copyright. Um, and you don't need to necessarily read or understand this, but you, um, the point is that you should use an existing license. Whatever license you use, it should be an existing license. And the reason for that is that these existing licenses have been prepared um, by lawyers who have experience with dealing with IP issues in not just the US legal system, but in legal systems around the world, and they have are well tested. So you don't want to just create your own license and throw it up on GitHub. Um, it's best to use kind of a pre-existing license that has a track record and that people will be familiar with. Um, right. So first question, can you use an open license? So I've just been talking as if, well, you can create a, a repository on GitHub and you can choose to license it and um, put it up under whatever license you wish. And for your personal work, of course, that's true. You know, if you're at, if you're working for, um, you know, a private company, it very well may not be true. So you have to, to talk with obviously people at your company that you're working for and find out what the rules are about what, what you can share and what you can't share um, for the stuff that you're doing at work. Or if you're at your university, you also have to ask and find out kind of what the policy is. Um, so here at, um, you know, here at CALS, things are quite permissive in terms of what you can uh, create and share. And so all of the work that I create and share here at CALS is licensed under um, standard permissive open source licenses. That's because I want, um, I want, you know, anybody who takes a course that I teach to be able to take my teaching materials and reuse them and repurpose them and, you know, in their own work. And of course, the licenses I use make it clear that, you know, I have a copyright and that I expect them to attribute, you know, the, the content that they have taken from me to me um, and to the CALS visualization lab, for example. But I make it available in such a way that people can kind of take it. And as long as they do that, they can do what they wish with it. Um, okay. Any questions about licenses? This is usually a, a controversial is the wrong word, but it's usually a, a topic that generates lots of, lots of discussion. So does anybody have any questions in the chat? Okay, so no questions. Um, so real quick, citation. So it's great practice to put a citation file in your GitHub repo. So if, if you are, are sharing code that's basically done, it's um, part of a published research project or something that you have, um, that you are basically finished doing, then you should put a citation or a citation.txt file in your GitHub repository that provides um, information about how you would want the code to be cited, ideally including um, different, um, this is something called BibTeX uh, format, I believe, for how it should be cited. And the reason that you should have a file like this is that um, various uh, tools and algorithms that crawl GitHub and GitLab and, and places looking for building citation graphs and things uh, will often look for this file um, and use the information in this file to uh, extract information about your project. So it's a good way to kind of, you know, marginally increase the um, notoriety of the work that you're doing. Um, and also, if anybody does want to cite your work, all they have to do is basically copy and paste from the citation.txt into their their um, uh, whatever citation tool they're using to, for their own work, and then that will um, automatically get you a site. Um, there's a link here to the Software Sustainability Institute. So Software Sustainability Institute is a great organization that has a lot of, of uh, resources and tips and tricks for helping make the software that you develop as part of your academic research projects um, more um, widely shared and used. Okay, hosting. So I think this is the last thing that um, 
I'm going to mention, and then we'll end. So um, hosting. So the only host that I've been talking about is GitHub. And I, I focus on GitHub because I think GitHub has become, I think, far and away the market leader in, in this area. Um, but there are also GitLab and Bitbucket are two other alternative uh, hosting sources for Git repositories. Um, and you can make your GitHub repositories and GitLab and Bitbucket citable by connecting um, versions of the GitHub repository uh, to DOIs via Zenodo. So there is a, a process for doing that. Um, um, and there's a link here to the documentation on, on how to do that. Um, uh, depending on the, uh, there's kind of quite a lot that could be done in terms of actually like just kind of talking you through some of these things, which is what I'm doing now versus actually demonstrating how to do it. And uh, so far we've not had um, enough uh, interest to justify kind of building a course about this. But when you get your feedback forms probably tomorrow or on Sunday, um, or on Thursday rather, then um, if you would like to have maybe a course or not necessarily like a full afternoon, but like a short course or video or something about how to actually do these things, then please let us know. We can consider kind of making some, some videos on, on how to create DOIs for GitHub repositories and things like that. So um, there's a question about how to add a license on an existing repository. So that's a good question. So why don't I demonstrate how to do that? That'll be a good thing to end on. So if we go to, um, so I'll just go back to this plants repository. So this doesn't have a license. So I want to add a license. So if I go to add a file and I'll create a new file and I'm gonna call this file uh, license. And um, actually over here, there's now a button that says choose a license template. And so I'll just click on that, choose a license template. And then I can go through here and find a license I want to use. So let's use the BSD3 clause. And then you can put your name and the year for the copyright information. And then this is the actual text of the license. If you just click review and submit, then it would kind of pre-populate this information. So if you're doing this via GitHub, this is using the GitHub user interface to do that. But let's say you didn't want to use the GitHub user interface. You just wanted to like create a file locally, copy and paste a license and stick it in there. In that case, what I would do is I would go to um, um, this choose an open source license uh, dot com, find the text of a license that um, that I wanted to use so if you want to i think if you click on this then these are going to be the full text of um the different licenses that are available so scroll down here find the license that is available um and the one i was going to use is not here so looking for a reference table of every license see the appendix so i'll go to the appendix so here is every license and so here's the BSD3 clause. So this is a nice table that kind of compares the different um, aspects of the licenses under you know, different metrics that you might, um, might be interested in. So I'll just go to the BSD3 uh, clause revised. And so here's the, the license. So you could basically copy, um, copy and paste this and then paste it into a file, add your you know, copyright year and the name of the copyright holder, add, commit those changes, and that would be another way to do it. So I can do that now if my JupyterLab is still with me. It appears that it is. So let's see where I am. OK. so. If I wanted to do, um, if I go over here and I was to create, um, sorry, new file, and I'll call this, uh, uh, what do I want to do? 
So rename license and then I'll open the license file. I'll paste in the, the text that I copied from choose a license.com. I would add, you know, copyright for the year and you know, my name, save it, then get status, get add license, get commit, add the license. And then I could uh, push these changes back to GitHub, but then I'd have to retype my password, which at this point in the day, I'm really loath to do, given how many times I mistyped it before. Um, so that basically now I've shown you kind of two ways to do it. So one would be the manual way, which is what I just showed you. And then prior to that would be the, you know, the, using the GitHub UI um, to do it by just creating a new file on GitHub. And then they actually have a button for a choose a license template to help you through that process. Um, it, even over here, it looks like you can do something by putting a GitHub repository URL in and then suggest that somebody use a particular license or something like this. Um, that might even be a third way to add a license to an existing repository. Okay. So uh, hopefully that answered the question on how to add a license to an existing repository. Um, are there any other questions? Because I'm, um, I'm all done, basically. I have nothing else to tell you about Git today. OK, so I don't see any more questions. So the video will go up uh, tomorrow. Um, I'll add some in the, the section for the description of the video. I'll add some links, things to um, uh, some of the links that we talked about today to the, the different uh, GUIs like GitHub Desktop and Git Kraken, um, and also some links to some where to go next for Git, Git training. So uh, there's some more uh, kind of intermediate teaching notes um, along the lines of the ones that we've, we've worked through here today. Um, so I'll put links to those, links to Git official Git documentation. Um, there are maybe some links to some other places where you can get more training on GitHub um, because Git, GitHub now has, has gotten um, a lot more and more uh, than, you know, when I got started using GitHub, it was only like basically a, a remote server where you push your Git repositories to and a bit of a UI and that was it. But now, there's a huge amount of, of stuff that you can accomplish on GitHub. Um, and you can even do software development on GitHub. They have a plugin for Microsoft Visual Studio Code and um, you can you know, develop completely on GitHub and using all the power of Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Um, so, and uh, Mohammed uh, has shared a another uh, recommended GUI for Git. So I will click that link. It's not one I'm familiar with, but I'll make sure to add that link to the description on YouTube so that others can, can take a look at it. Um, and well, thank you very much. And I look forward So next week is spring break here at Cal. So we will not be having a workshop next week. Uh, the week after that, uh, we'll be back with um, intro to SQL uh, for data science. And that's the last um, the last training in kind of the core curriculum. And then after that, we have two more trainings on introduction to machine learning with scikit-learn, which I'll be teaching. And then the very last workshop is on an introduction to image classification with Keras that will be taught by my colleague, Glendon Holst. Um, so you'll get links to register for those workshops tomorrow um, with the feedback form. If you've not registered from them already, I encourage you to do so. They're gonna be really good, yeah. hopefully. Um, so with that, I'll just end. So thank you very much for spending another Tuesday afternoon with me and I will see you in two weeks time.
And thank you all very much for the uh, the positive feedback. This this is one of the most difficult workshops for me to teach um, because it's the Git is very technical and a bit dry relative to say programming in Python where you're maybe making plots and doing data analysis and all these kinds of things. So I, I appreciate you all being willing to uh, stick with me this afternoon and that I'm glad that you seem to have gotten quite a lot out of it. So that's nice to see. Okay, so I'm gonna sign off now. I'll see you in a couple of weeks and uh, you know, please be sure to register if you haven't already done so.